Welcome back to the Lester Women's Wrap-Up Show. Another super fun episode. I'm really excited about this one. I've got James with me like usual. How are you today, James? Yeah, good, thanks. It's sunny in Leicester today, so can't complain. And on to the FA Cup semifinals. We're going to get into that, but I think we can't, like, there's, can't feel any better. <laughs> then we got a super special guest with us. Ian has joined us, the voice of Leicester. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. That's so awesome. We're so excited to have you here. So this is going to be really fun. So obviously, like, we just have to talk about yesterday's win. Hmm. On to the <laughs> FA Cup semifinal. I'm sure you guys feel great. I'm just still super excited, so I had to mention it. Yeah, it was um, it was historic. It was strange turning up to a game that kind of knew they were going to win. And that in itself, having followed Leicester City for the amount of time that I have, is pretty strange. But I was supremely confident because for a number of different reasons, really. I think the Europa League hindered Manchester United. I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's team selection was questionable. But mm -hmm. Leicester were the better team and it just shows how far the football club have come. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm just so excited. <laughs> when Pipes was on, he said, if we make it to the FA Cup final, you have to come out here. So yes. now I'm like, well, I got to start saving up now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So obviously this is a show about the women's game. So we're going to be asking you some questions. But to start off, I just wanted to kind of hear about your background and your journey into broadcasting. Um, hmm. I, I always wanted to play uh, football in a professional capacity. I was never good enough. Um, I could play. <clears throat> I was I was okay, decent enough player, um, but I never had it in me to be a professional. And so I started to try and think about careers that I could have that weren't playing but were were within the game. Whilst I did that, I, I worked in retail. I worked in electronics straight out of college. I've got GCSEs. I did a year of college. Dropped out of college because I didn't like it and went straight into the workplace, didn't go to university, don't have an A-level to my name, and started working in retail. And I always had the dream of working in football, but I didn't realise that dream until I got I got very, very lucky on Radio 1 one day when there was... It's a strange story. Um, <laughs> on my 21st birthday, there was a competition. You had to commentate on your CD collection as though it was a game of football. And I'd gone to the gym that morning, and I had Radio 1 on on the way back. And a guy called Mark Chapman was was reading the sport. He now presents Match of the Day two and and Five Live and and I called in and got through and I had to commentate on my CD collection for sixty <laughs> seconds as though it was a game of football. And it was this was in when was I twenty one two thousand and two, um, and I, I won. Like there was a competition to win, and I got through to a final on the Friday. That this was on my twenty first birthday, whatever day of the week that was. I think it was a Wednesday. And then on Friday, all the winners from all the different days, the five days, were in a final, and I won Friday's final. And it was a, a football FA Cup songs uh, quiz. And I went to Cardiff to watch Chelsea Arsenal with nine friends in an executive box as a prize and was around some broadcasters and always said to them, Look, I've always fancied it, what do I do? And they said, camp on the doorstep of your local radio station. So I did. I lived in Luton then, and I did at Three Counties Radio. And I literally, as cliched as it is, but at 22, 21, 22 years old, I started making the tea at my local radio station. I promise you, that's what I was doing. My first job was making the tea. And from there, I've, I've slowly tried to progress. <laughs> I think I think you've made it. <laughs> I've done okay. There's a long way to go. That's that's an awesome story that's better than your typical i applied and i got the job that's awesome yeah. no you, you just I, I had to work a different way i knew i did and you know i remember i was once sitting in luton i just had an operation on my knee a bit like pipes but he had a few more than me um and i was 20 years old and i was sitting there in in luton um which is not the nicest town in the world i've got to tell you um <laughs> and i was sat there and, and the local radio station was over the road from me and i remember sitting there thinking Oh, can you imagine, like, doing a game covering maybe Luton or Watford, who were the two best teams that that radio station covered? They covered Wickham and MK Dons as well. Covering a game and it involving Leicester and being a cup game. And in my career, I did a Leicester game. I was like, wow, that'd be incredible to call a game and my boyhood team be involved in that game. You know, it was Watford against Leicester in the cup or something. And I remember metaphorically grabbing a hold of myself there and then going, mate, you're not even you're not even in the front door, let alone able to work on the air. So you need to calm down, let alone ever see a Leicester City game in a professional capacity. And and then 
I ended up with uh, with the job where that's what I get paid to do every week. I'm a very, very, very lucky boy. That's yeah, that's awesome. That's the dream. Getting paid to watch football. I'm sure that's <laughs> the dream of so many people. So that's just awesome for you. Like that's a great story. I, I want to say like I'm so proud, but <laughs> you made it so long ago. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a long time ago, but I, I do wake up every day and I really do enjoy my job. I'm very, very lucky to do what I do. Yeah. So kind of walk us through a bit. Like, what does your day usually look like? Um, different days have different things and different challenges. Obviously, it depends on whether Leicester City have got a midweek game. If they've got right. a midweek game, then those weeks are busier because there's more press conferences. But for example, this week's probably a bad week because there's an international break. But normally a Monday is, is centred around our phone-in show, which is a football forum on a Monday night between 6 and 7 o'clock. It's a show that's been going for decades and um, it's had lots of different iterations of, of the show. The moaning, people call it sometimes because... <laughs> folk will call in and have a whinge about things which is fine because that's football and that's what we do um but we've tried to evolve it now to be something different with matt piper on and he's brilliant and owen's a great producer so on a monday we'll plan guest book today for example i've tried to get gary lineker on the show tonight we may oh, wow. be successful in that we may not um we'll have to wait and see but a guest basically that can look back at 1982 and the semi-final but guests sort the technicals do some some audio get some audio ready tuesday ordinarily i work to a different show actually because tuesday is usually a down day but if there's a midweek game then then it's not wednesday off it's long run day on a wednesday for me but i have wednesday off and then thursday's press conference day it can be the men's press conference and or the women's press conference these days so we i attend that edit that on a thursday normally we broadcast that with a show on thursday with alan Birchnell. And on Friday's match prep, so stats, preparation for the game the next day, and then on the day it's travel to the game and and crack on, really, and then repeat. Sounds like the dream. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I am very, very lucky and try and raise three children in between. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I know kids can be a hassle. I've got two young brothers, and I'm glad they're not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're great at times, but they're all Leicester City fans. They have to be. Uh, or watching the Foxes and hoping that they do well. Well, you can't complain then. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. I, I think you've had a brilliant career, Ian, and, and, and I, I would, you're probably what I would call Leicester City royalty because you've been pr probably probably since I was growing up. Um, I think you joined Radio Leicester around 20, 2008, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've been listening to you probably since then. Um, and some of the games you've called that I've there were highs and there were lows but some of the games that i've heard you call have just been amazing the way you get the atmosphere but you're not actually there i think that's a really difficult thing to do but you and the team grasp it really well so i think for me is what's probably the best game you've ever commentated on and why well james firstly that's the ultimate compliment to a commentator you know when people say people can say lots of nice things lots of horrible things but lots of nice things um, and when they say, if somebody ever says to you, stop you in the street, which I'm lucky because in this city, we're a one club city. So I am fortunate that in this city, some people, not many or even all, but some people will stop you and go, oh, I listen to you, I enjoy what you do. But when they do stop you, if you do chat to people and they say the immortal words as a commentator, you make me feel like I'm there. That's gold. That's it. That's as good as it gets. It doesn't get better. Because radio is so romantic. Radio is beautiful. The television is great. The television paints pictures and social media as well. And, and Hannah from, you know, how you follow football and, and at different times and time zones. And, you know, you, you pick up your phone and these days you'll, you'll get a lot on your phone with social. But when you've got a radio, James, particularly like you said, like kind of transistor radios, battery powered radios and and you're tuned in. You know, sometimes people send me pictures, I love this sort of thing, um, of people huddled around a taxi. Because I'm at the game, right? I've got to focus on the game. We're unscripted for four hours. So we've got radio to create, good radio, engaging radio. And so you, what you don't get to see is you don't get to see people listening, as perverse as that sounds. Obviously you don't. But sometimes people will go, oh, uh, for example, here's a good example. Um, a friend of mine's a pro tennis player. Her name's Katie Bolter. She's based in Woodhouse Eaves. Professional tennis player on the women's tour. Very, very, very good tennis player. She sent me a picture the other day of her grandfather, Gramps, 
she took a picture of him listening to the radio and listening to us. And just seeing that, you know, people huddled around taxis is just, is just incredible. And there's a real romance of radio because you paint pictures. That's what you've got to do. Our job is to inform and entertain and educate. What's my favorite game to commentate on? And thank you very much for saying I'm, I'm Radio Leicester royalty, by the way. That's, that's a really kind thing to say. I'm approaching game 700, I think. So it feels wow. like I've been here a while. Um, that's here. <clears throat> Did a few before. My favorite game to commentate on, probably. It's tough because I was at the bridge uh, on the 2nd of May uh, in 2016. That was bizarre. It was my birthday the day before, and we were at Old Trafford, obviously, for the draw against Manchester United. But before then, we'd already had to make arrangements for the 2nd of May. So we'd had to speak to Chelsea on the Friday and say, look, it's highly unlikely, but if Leicester draw with Man United and it's on your game with Spurs, could we have a place in the press box? And Chelsea's press box is so tight. I mean, literally, it's like shoulder. I'm, I'm a pretty broad lad. Me and Pipes, we have to overlap our shoulders. My shoulder will go in front, Pipes will go behind, and we'll just sweat. <laughs> it's so tight. And they were like, yeah, no problem, you can come down. And so on the 2nd of May, went down, and and I called, I called the goal that I never felt. I never, you know, Leicester fans didn't dream of winning the Premier League because it wasn't in our shop. Our toy shop did not have the Premier League in it. It had the FA Cup on the top shelf. And Vishai put us in the lift and went, I've got something better for you, lads and lasses. Come up here. And took us to a different floor that we didn't know existed. Um, so to call that goal, and I called that goal off the air as well. This is a, a bit might be a bit technical, but because we didn't we didn't want to broadcast the game, because if Spurs beat them two, three, four nil, who's gonna listen? Who cares? Right? It's all on the Leicester game. So what we did, we sent Jason Bourne, our presenter, to the local hero, who we'd already spoken to Dave, the, the manager, could we go down? So he went down, but we were seven, seven seconds ahead of the TV pictures. So we were broadcasting on the radio. Jason had his headphones on, but Jason was with Matt Elliott, and we were kind of making radio and talking about the what-ifs, what's happening in the game. But I was at the bridge, so every now and then they'd throw to me, what's happening? Spurs are 2-0 up. But that relied on, and you're speaking to him next week about this, by the way, and it will be his greatest contribution to radio ever. A 19-year-old, Owen Palmer Atkin, was sat in the studio basically press, pressing the buttons. Now, it's really geeky. Apologies if this is a little bit too geeky, but because he could hear me at Stamford Bridge in one ear, and in the other ear, he could hear Jason. Jason doesn't know what's going on at the bridge, because if he looks at the TV screen, it's seven seconds old, because I've already seen it, because... TV pictures, go to a satellite in space, come back down, and then they go to your TV screens. So Owen has literally just had to put my fader up if there's a goal. So when I'm commentating on that Eden Hazard goal, I don't know whether that's going out on the air. I've just got to call it and hope that we're on the air. And we were. And I nailed it, which I was very pleased about. So to answer your question, James, I'm going to say... I'm not going to say that game. I'm going to say May the 7th when they lifted the Premier League trophy at home. My dad was there. And going into a game knowing that your little football team are going to be lifting the Premier League trophy, I'll, I've never experienced that. King, he scored. He's my hero. Um, I'm going to say May the 7th, 2016, Leicester beat in Everton. Nice. Uh, one thing I will say about May the 2nd, I know that we, we watched the game at home. Then a bunch of us piled into a taxi, talking about taxis. Um, and then we're outside the King Power till about mm -hmm. three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, it was just one of them nights that you had to do it. Um, and the atmosphere was unbelievable down there. I've never experienced anything like that in my life and hopefully will again, but you never Let's know. Hope so. Let's hope. I remember tripping over a champagne bottle. As cliched again as that is, I was stood there because I was with you, James. I went down there. So I went from the bridge, drove at the speed limit from <laughs> West London up to Leicester, uh, parked up and I went straight to the stadium with you and stood there for a few hours singing and enjoying. And I looked down at one stage because I felt something under my feet. I looked down and genuinely I was kicking a champagne bottle. And there's a horrible irony that two years later I was stood on the same piece of tarmac, on the same, exactly the same path when we were mourning the loss of the chairman, the late, great Convishai. So there's been some 
some happy and some very difficult memories. But yeah, I was I was with you down there, James, on the second mate, singing and screaming late into the <laughs> night, and I was back there at half five the next morning to work. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of us were at work the next day and saw heads, but it didn't matter, did it? <laughs> I dream to experience that one day. That'd you be will, great. <laughs> you will. It's going to have to happen. Hopefully, if they get to the FA Cup final, then then that's going to that's going to have to happen. And and there's uh, the restrictions enable that to happen as well. Yeah, fingers crossed. I, it's so hard to predict anything in the world nowadays. Mm. All we can predict are games at this point, and even those like are unpredictable <laughs> this season. Yeah. You never know what's happening. It's fun though. <laughs> so looking onto the women's side of things, so obviously it's been like quite a season for our women's side, mm -hmm. and you guys have become super involved, which is just awesome to see. Like hearing it on the radio and everything, it's like yeah, so happy because it's just so nice to see the women's game in general being promoted even more. And obviously this morning we saw BBC and Sky both sign three-year deals to show the WSL, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I'm going to do here in Canada, but I'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think that means for the women's game in general? I think it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's deserved. I think it's warranted. Um, I think it's, <clears throat> it's easy to reflect on it and celebrate and say well done to the broadcasters that have done that but actually I think there's an obligation on the broadcasters to do that I think the the quality and the evolution of the game warrants it on on the editorial merit of what's going on on the television or on the radio it merits it it warrants it so it makes perfect sense I, I'm glad there was a bidding war I'm glad that people were grappling for the rights because that means that there's interest. It means that the broadcasters know they can see the future. They know, they know what's going on. Um, and the fact again, Leicester City women, fingers crossed, uh, are going to make it into the WSL if they're able to, makes it even better. So <clears throat> I think it's another great step for the women's game, which is becoming more and more prominent, rightly so. But what I hope and what I think is going on at the moment is it isn't tokenism. It isn't. Mm -hmm old good old women's football let's include it it's actually it's it's a good standard of football and we're comparing the standard of football with that standard of football and the meritocracy that exists within that um i think it's good to, it's, it's good to hear it's good to see and and long may that sort of thing continue to be honest yeah absolutely because right now it's just so difficult to be able to watch games like even for people who are in the uk i know it can be a pain so it's just so great to see, and obviously BBC is massive, so this is really great to see. Yeah. And like I mentioned before, you guys cover it on the radio. What has it been like kind of discussing the women's side and seeing them transition into this super successful side and gaining the support from the club? Well, we've followed Leicester City women for quite a while, actually. I've known Jonathan Morgan for a number of years. Um, I used to have him on the air on a, a Tuesday night on a semi-regular basis, Holly as well, Holly Morgan. Um, would come on the air and talk about how they were doing and and their struggles, which they had. They had struggles as a team and recruitment and maintaining players and keeping players. Um, and we we fleetingly because it, it's tough for us. People like will look at us and and expect, understandably, expect the best coverage of everything that they can possibly get, and that's cool. There's only three of us. Our mm -hmm. sports team is three. And we've got Leicester City, Leicester Tigers, Leicestershire County Cricket Club, Leicester City Women. And then you start looking at our basketball team are the best in the country in the Leicester Riders. Our netball team are one of the best in the country in, in Loughborough Lightning. Loughborough Lightning women's cricket are one of the best. Loughborough Lightning women's rugby are one of the best. Mark Selby's one of the best snooker players in the world. Uh, we've got Loughborough University that's got loads of Team GB athletes based in it. We've got such a huge patch got a race course a horse race course such a huge patch and there's three of us you know so it's hard it's hard for us to to try and stay across it but what we try and do is do it on the basis of of what deserves it what's the best quality and and Leicester City women's football is certainly there we've tried to follow them in the championship particularly this season the, the professional movement has helped us because mm -hmm. being a more professional club has helped us to latch onto that and use that resource so like press conferences Hannah every week are a lot easier now because they're managed by Leicester City like going to games we sent to, to one of the cup games earlier on in the season it was easy we could go and scout the stadium 
risk, make sure we could do what we could do because broadcast facilities aren't great um, mm -hmm. at Farley Way. So, yeah, it's it's an evolution for us as well. We're not perfect by any stretch. I keep harassing the boss to try and get a, a Leicester City women's football reporter, um, even just for a match day. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Um, preferably that's a female, by the way, um, because it should be like um, that's what we should be doing. Uh, we're, we're just trying to change the face a little bit of of the sport team. He says, sat here as a middle-aged white man. Um, <laughs> I know that there's an irony in that as well, but we, we're aware of that. We know, and we want to change that. So yeah, no, we've loved it. We've enjoyed it. No, Jonathan. No, a lot of the the players and. Just hope that they can get over the line. Hope that they can manage it. Hope they can get promoted. And and WSL for the football club would be massive. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I would love to see that trophy get lifted. <laughs> so, but you answered my next question, which because I've been seeing a lot of people saying, like, messaging me about the show and things and stuff like that, saying like we would love to see BBC provide like commentary and stuff. But you said now you want a reporter down there at the women's game and there is only three of you. So it's hard. And I guess that kind of answers my question of, do you have any plans in the future, but you've covered it. That's awesome to hear. We want to. Yeah. And we're trying to free up some money to be able to do that, to be able to send somebody, but also to get them on the air, like on a Monday night, I'd love to, because the football forum is the most downloaded podcast in BBC local radio. Now there's 41 now local radio stations, so obviously BBC Radio Leicester, there's Nottingham, there's Derby, there's London, there's loads, 41 of us, all, very, all local. And the Football Forum is the most downloaded podcast of any genre across local radio. So our Monday night show hits a lot of people. So a lot of people heard you reporting on Leicester City, Hannah, which is great. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of podcast. messages. <laughs> well, it's good. And that's a good thing because that's what it should do. But with that, that provides a really good opportunity because what we could do is we can incorporate Leicester City women into that show. It's not an exclusively Leicester City men's show. Now, listen, we understand that for now. And it's because it's the way it is. The majority of people are going to be interested in the men's game. That's cool. But also those people, those audience members still have an interest in the women's team. It's not you exclusively, you either like one team or you like the other. You're allowed to like both and, and our audience will. So we want a reporter to be able to talk about, you know, what's gone on, the game, some of the players, the characters, because that's what you need to know. You need to get close to the players. You need to form opinions of the characters. We all love Kelechi Inacho. Now, why? Because he was down and out and not scoring. He couldn't hit a cow's backside with a banjo. But now <laughs> he's scoring goal after goal after goal. And he's... He's on BBC One yesterday after his interview screaming, yes! And we all love that because we've all seen the clip on social and we love him. We're falling in love with him. And that's what happens when you, you bring characters to life in the media in a positive sense. And that's what we want to try and do with Leicester City Women. We want to try and do that. I'd love for us to incorporate the, more, the, the side more onto the air. But, you know, it's a slow thing. It's a gradual mm -hmm. thing. Because what you can't do, you could go, right, we're going to go massive for this game. What do you do next week? Because your audience expect the same and you yeah. might not have the resource. So you've got to manage it as carefully as you can. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to follow them. We're going to, we're going to stick with them through thick and thin, good stories or bad stories. That's what we do. That's how we roll. Um, but yeah, I hope, I hope to bring as much more Leicester City women's coverage as we can. That's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's really good. I know that me and Hannah started this um, to try and spread the Leicester City women's a bit more, trying to get uh, the women's game promoted a bit more with, within the fan bases. Mm. Um, and like with our men's channel, so in the men's channel, we generally do previews and, and reviews and we get opposition fans on. We found it really difficult to find opposition fans um, to do this. Mm. Um, there are a, a few of them have supporters clubs, some of them don't. But I think it's just getting that word out there gradually, like you said, and, and trying to promote this as best we can. And, and we're, never, we're not going to stop, are we, Hannah? <laughs> There's no stopping. There's never too much promotion of anything. <laughs> I wasn't sure if James was done. <laughs> Sorry. No. All right. Over to you. Um, so just kind of like talking about this promotion and everything from like a media broadcasting standpoint, you've obviously brought in these ideas that are just brilliant and so happy to hear what you're wanting to incorporate. 
But outside of like BBC and just from like a media standpoint in general, what more do you think you could be done to help promote the women's game and lesser women? Um, I think so much of this is about is about time. Like as hard as that sounds, uh, and and people don't really have control over that, but but you you get an association with a sports team, club, players, and management with an increased association over time with them. So I think it's I think time is just going to help to ingrain into the psyche of local Leicester people that Leicester City women are actually a good team mm -hmm. and they're, they're playing in the WSL if indeed they get there and that the WSL is a top division in women's football and that this is where they play. And just starting that, just starting that, that evolution you know it can't be a revolution it can't be overnight right we expect this overnight that's not how it's going to work it's going to evolve it's going to get bigger it's going to get better but it's slow steps even like sharing the same platform for press conferences for example the other day brendan did his and then immediately after jonathan did his for the women's team and that was great because people stuck around they're like oh, okay let's see what what jonathan's got to say now we were always going to stick around um, but I think it's things like that. But they're s small little things, Hannah, that will help, that will build that into people. And, you know, the people it hits is social media, social for girls and, and boys. You know, boys who go and watch women's football is great, but it's the access is going to do them do them proud. So my daughter, for example, is, is 15. She loves netball. Uh, she's a big netball fan. But the fact that Leicester City women are doing well, she takes interest. She's interested. She's like, oh, cool. And getting to know a few of the people. And it's just awareness. It's media awareness. But Leicester City women need to, and they are, because the football club are very smart at this, use social media to their advantage as best they can. Because that is where the younger generations and the current generation will latch onto things and follow these characters. And again, we come back to it. The characters, the people, the human beings. Mm -hmm. We did a show after the... Um, after the game in the FA Cup against Manchester United, a two-hour Leicester City women's getting to know you show where um, Kirsty Lavelle, Remy Allen, Alishante Paul uh, and Ashley Plumpter were all interviewed by Owen and I. They all chose some songs. It wasn't like proper tactical focus, positional personnel stuff. It was your journey through football. Why football? Tell us about your teammates and tell us about your favourite songs. Tell us about what you do afterwards. And Ashante Paul was incredible because she was like, I moved out of London as a teenage girl, packed my bags, packed the van, got to Leicester, opened the door, and Jonathan Morgan was there at my new flat. And he opened the doors and started lifting stuff out of my van for me. Wow. And that, that's Leicester. That's, that's class. That's, that's what the club needs to be. And it's those little stories, to answer your question, it's those stories and that information being spread via social or via a radio station like us with that sort of content that people think that's nice that i like that and <laughs> it's mainly time use social media to advantage ultimately nigel pearson always said to me uh when he was talking to me um nigel used to say to me fans care about results you win on a saturday you're a hero so jonathan morgan knows that keep winning that will create interest there's other things you can do as well but ultimately winning games of football helps yeah, definitely. It helps my mood too. <laughs> it really <laughs> defines how I'm going to be during the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you and everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of just going off like your story of getting to know the players, we always say on the show that we can tell that both the men's and women's sides are just so connected and so involved as like it's a community more than it's just a club. So with what you do, obviously you probably get a sense of that as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think that there's, a, there's an obligation on on every part of the club to be part of the club. Um, and I think that should be the same for every club, to be honest. Mm -hmm. If you're Chelsea or Arsenal or Man City or Manchester United, then there's still an obligation to be close to your community. But Leicester City have the opportunity to do that in a really almost unique way because we are a one club city. You know, even Nottingham have got Forest and County. Um Leicester City can do that because they can visit people and visit places and schools and community events. I remember following uh, the football club in the International Champions Cup after they'd won the Premier League and 
First game was in Glasgow um, against Celtic. Second game was against Paris Saint-Germain in Los Angeles. And the third game was against Barcelona in Stockholm. And we were in LA and um, the club organised a fans event in Santa Monica on on a whatever it was, Sunday night, Monday night. And I went along and it was it was a typical British bar in Santa Monica, I'll be <laughs> honest. It was an Irish bar, so you know, that as a non drinker I wasn't massively kind of bothered. I went <laughs> went along and like that was a community event in Santa Monica. And you thought they took Birch, they took Philbert, they took the Premier League trophy, Christian Fuchs was there and there was there was a couple of hundred locals that liked football they were like oh Leicester City here that's cool and they went into that community it's not all about here it's not you know I'm I'm I could throw a golf ball at the cathedral from where I am right now I'm next to the cathedral I'm right in the heart of the city it's not necessarily about here your community work isn't all in your own city go in and traveling the globe as they have and do and selling that into other communities is really important as well so and I think that their eyes were opened to that Hannah when they won the Premier League when they're like oh yeah, when you're the biggest story in the world, they were the biggest story on the planet that night. There was no bigger news story. Number one on the news agenda everywhere. They thought, hmm, opportunity to not just be about Seistan. There's an opportunity to be about the world and sell what we do. But what we've got to do, it's important that what we do is the right stuff. And that's what they've done. They've gone on that journey and they, they really do educate and help and support um really really well i've got to say the women's the women's team do do that and want to do that and and have obviously had their own challenges with different things this season with that in mind um but you've got to buy in you've got to buy into the club ethic and and i certainly think they're going to do that yeah absolutely and it's just it's grown and it's just going to keep growing which is what's so great to see i have to ask about your trip to la did you meet will ferrell (laughs) i've got a will ferrell story right oh (laughs) So um, there was a media event uh, because Will was launching LA United. United? LAFC, I think. Um, And there was a a media event, but for one reason or another, I think because of the LA traffic, which is horrendous, by the way, I didn't go. (laughs) Now, what I did do, I went to watch Liverpool-Chelsea in Pasadena. And I got a ticket from somebody at the ICC and so I went to the game now I took my recording equipment which these days is just my phone that I'm using now um so I went to Pasadena and a Rose Bowl what a stadium by the way oh Oh, yeah it was one of those times right where I'm sitting in Pasadena I'd I'd, I'd been to that was my first time in the States I'd never been to America my first time in the States and I'm in LA and the sun's setting and when the sun sets on the west coast the sun sets properly it's orange and blood red everywhere and i'm like in this open arena that has seats 120,000, it's a big bowl and the sun's set and the people are eating churros like at the football i'm like are you mad it's meant to eat pie it's meant to be cold man <laughs> and and i'm watching the football and i'm like yeah that lad in luton that wanted to watch a luton versus leicester game do you remember him well <laughs> you've got lucky here kid i'm sat there watching the game Anyway, I finished the game and I arranged to meet up with a guy called Adrian Bouchard, who's a guy that's making Jamie Vardy the movie, or was, or is he? We'll see. Anyway, <laughs> due to meet him, met him after the game. Uh, Liverpool-Chelsea in the ICC. Met him after the game, sun setting, there's goals, it's brilliant, it's boiling hot, incredible. Um, so I met Adrian in the, in, the, um, in the car lot, car park we call it. Got, spoke to him, interviewed him, happy days. Anyway, getting on to my getting on to my Will Ferrell story. I looked to my left and there's a Mustang. And I just heard you hear a Mustang when they start, right? There's Mustang. I've looked and I'm like, I recognise that curly hair. I know who that is. It's Will Ferrell. So I thought, right, you've got a couple of options. I don't get starstruck. And to be honest, I wasn't particularly starstruck with Will Ferrell. He's an actor. So what? I, I speak to people who have, have done fine for themselves every day. So I was like, Will Ferrell, whatever. Do I doorstep him or do I not? Now, he's with his family. It's a night off. He's gone to watch Chelsea, Liverpool. Fine. And I thought, in for a penny, in for a pound, James. And I went and gave it a go. And I stood there, knocking on his passenger window. Had my BBC badge. So I was like, 
One minute, one minute to talk about the football. What? Because he knows Christian Fuchs. He and Christian are, are good friends. One minute, one minute, and he's looked at me and gone, and driven off. <laughs> <laughs> so I got custard pied by Will Ferrell. But you know, I don't care because it's cool because he's Will Ferrell and he's in Elf, and everyone yeah. loves Elf. But um, <laughs> West Coast is beautiful. LA was. LA was very, very odd. Um, like, I'm here watching Leicester City play. I remember getting there on Thursday and they hadn't laid the pitch at the StubHub in LA. They hadn't laid the pitch. It was sand. Um, thinking, I'm getting paid to watch. I'm getting paid to be here. That's madness. This is all madness. And the team I'm watching are the Premier League champions. But I, no, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my trip to... Um, Enjoyed my trip to Los Angeles. Didn't enjoy the US customs throwing me out at the border and sending me home, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there with the US border. Not thrown out. But you ain't got the right paperwork. <laughs> that's right. sending you home. Now, luckily, I was only in Dublin because there's a border in Dublin, right? You can cross the US border in, in Ireland, so you don't have to do it the other end. And they turned me away. They were like, you've got a signature in the wrong place. I'm like, and in Britain, normally, they'd go, we get it. It's in the wrong place, but you got it in you go. The US were like, no. I was like, yeah, but come on, look, it's there. It's, there. it's just, I went, no. What are you going to do? They said, we're getting your luggage off the plane. I laughed. He went, so we've got your luggage off the plane. And then a conveyor belt came past and my luggage is there. I'm thinking, no. So the US border control turned me away. I had to get a flight the next day and get the paperwork signed. <laughs> They're tough. They're tough. <laughs> They don't take it easy. They don't make it easy at all. I got held up at customs once and <laughs> for no reason, but oh. I won't get into that either. <laughs> I'm going to end up on social media everywhere and people are going to be like, what did Hannah do? <laughs> I promise I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. but I'm pretty biased because I'm from the West Coast, so it is absolutely beautiful here. Oh. 100%. Oh. Redondo <laughs> Beach I was in. I was staying in Redondo Beach um, in L.A., and again, I remember just walking down. There's just, obviously, there's miles and miles of beach. It's like Baywatch. It's just unbelievable. And I remember walking down and again, sunsetting, and they've got outdoor beach volleyball nets just up for the public to play on. You just turn up beach volleyball, you play. You don't like have to set it up or book a court or anything. It's just there. And I remember sitting there having like a lime and soda, looking out over the beach and seeing three or four courts worth of people playing beach volleyball, sunsetting over the ocean. I'm thinking, mate. It doesn't get better than this. It was in, I loved it. I loved the West Coast of the United States, I've got to say. You have to come to the West Coast of Canada. We're, we're pretty good, too. Our beaches are fake, but it's nice. Okay. A friend of mine, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Seattle's not far from the border on the West, is it? No, I could hop on a boat and be in Seattle right yeah, now. Yeah, so a friend too. of mine, Arlo White, who's a big Leicester fan, uh, he reported on Seattle Sounders for a long, long time, and... I kind of got to know a little bit about just only through him that kind of part of the world and and Canada does it does interest me that that part of the world does interest me massively. In fact, my stepmom's about to move to like North Vermont on the east east coast, kind of quite north again, not far from the border. So yeah, I'd uh, I'd like to venture into Canada one day. It looks beautiful. Like I said, I'm biased. So yeah, it's very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but kind of your story about. Um how people are eating churros during the game and stuff. Like, it's funny that there, that's not normal. But, like, I'm used to going to hockey games where I'm eating a churro, I'm eating a hot dog, I have popcorn, I've got two beers. <laughs> so, <laughs> for me, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, not allowed beers at the football in this country at the minute. Yeah, well, I'll adjust. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, James, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just just one thing obviously we had to touch on Wembley at some point um semi-finals um are you and your team going I presume so yeah we've um sent our emails off today to get accreditation uh and secure a place we don't know what day it's going to be yet we think it's going to be the Saturday because it would make sense for Man City Chelsea to be the Sunday um get everything sorted and and get to Wembley. Now, the strange thing is, when Spurs played at home at Wembley for a long time, they, you know, you went to Wembley and it, it didn't feel right then. I've done Leicester City at Wembley in the Community Shield when they were Premier League champions. I played Man United. Um, but an FA Cup semi final is going to feel pretty special. Going to feel really special. So, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I went to a lot of the playoff finals at the old Wembley. Um, yeah. 
amazing days. Um, then the new Wembley was there, like you say, and then Spurs used it for a bit and it just didn't seem like the proper Wembley, as I would call it, where you just went there for finals. Um, yeah. And I think this year, as a fan, not being able to go to a semi-final at Wembley mm. is really disappointing. Um, I just hope we can get some fans in there for the final if we get there. Fingers yeah. crossed. I agree. Well, were you at Blackburn in 92? Yes. Swindon, 93? Yes. Derby, 94? Yep. Palace 96? Yes. Likewise. I was at the mall as well as a as a young lad with my dad watching and the heartache but then the um then the euphoria. Tell you what, Hannah, you've never you've not been to Leicester. We asked you that the other day, didn't we? No, I haven't made it out to the UK at all. Okay, but bear, bear with me. How do I flip my camera around? I'm not sure I can, but because I work where I work, let me see if I can help you out with something. Oh, can we get like a little tour? <laughs> a little tour. You won't be able to see through that window because of the... No, you won't. So what I'll do... I'll see... <laughs> so this is our building. This is our office. Our studios are back there. But that's not the important part. This is the important part. Doors <laughs> open. So, stand by. Are we losing them? I think we've lost video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. You got me? Yeah. yeah, you're back now, yeah. There's the Guild Hall. Okay. That's like a 600-year-old building that's in the city. And then next to it, hopefully up there, you'll be able to see. Oh, yeah. Nice. Our cathedral. Yeah, that's awesome. We we reburied a king in there. Found a dead king in a car park a good few years ago. Uh, and then, I feel like I heard about that. You've read about it? Yeah, I think I heard about it a couple years ago. Yeah, Richard III. It was found in a car park in the city. And the, um, the suggestion was that he was the one that was haunting the football club because until he was found and reburied, uh, they hadn't won anything. So... He was obviously the spirit that was <laughs> that was lurking over them. But yeah, so that's that's uh, that's our view from our office. We can literally look through the look through the blinds. I'm just right there. Awesome. There it is. Better than seeing the back of a building. Yes. <laughs> One day, uh, James will get his private jet out to you. Pipe <laughs> over. Yeah, that's the dream to make it out there. It sucks that this pandemic had to happen, but as soon as, like I said before, as soon as it's all cleared up, I am out there. Yeah. I'm going on a whole UK tour. <laughs> yeah, totally. So you should spend a few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, just talking about Wembley, our women's side are in the FA Cup as well. So hopefully they make it out there too. And then hopefully I'll be out there for two finals. But for now, it's going to be... Great. So thank you so much for coming on. It was awesome getting to chat with you. It was fun hearing all of your wicked stories. I loved the Will Ferrell one. I'm sorry he rejected you, but <laughs> at least yeah, you can say right, you got man. rejected by Will Ferrell. I'm okay with it because it's a good story, isn't it? You know, we were literally stood in the car park and and then I had to try and get an Uber back to Redondo Beach from Pasadena. And being a Leicester boy, I'm like, oh, it's just a different suburb. It's like 20 minutes and you'll be home. Mm -mm. Nope. No, uh, yeah, I shared an Uber with two guys that didn't speak to me all the way and ended up ended up getting back to where I needed to get back to. But yeah, that was a night in Pasadena I'll never forget. Will yeah. Ferrell put a custard pie in my face, but there you go. At least you can say it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I thank hope you. we can chat again soon. It was super fun getting to talk and I hope you have a great day as well. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and James, thank you for helping and... Um, yeah, we'll get you on the air again soon to talk Leicester City women when they cross the line and get confirmed promotion. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks.